Well, good morning, New Hope. It's good to see you. Good to be with you. You got to meet my wife. So that's the best of our time together. So in conclusion, thank you for coming and we'll see you next week. Can't get any better than that. So it is good to be here. We're talking about uh, this Issachar idea. We're talking about how we might be steadfast in very tumultuous times, how we might represent Jesus and his kingdom when the world's a mess and divided. Have you noticed that people are just mad at each other nowadays? And then people are mad at the people who are mad at the people. And so it just kind of multiplies. There's a great sense of division around us. How might we live in this way? This is a passion for me Uh, because I'm what's called a missiologist. I have a PhD in a field called missiology. My uh, role is to train people to engage cultures. Sometimes that's missionaries who are going cross-culturally. But today, a lot of us, just as Christians who love Jesus in our neighborhoods, in our homes, in our our communities, in our schools, in our jobs, we're seeing that the world is shifting around us. People are very, very divided, and we're asking, how might we live faithfully in these times? So we're talking about this idea that we want to be like people of Issachar who understood the times and knew therein what they should do. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I want you to tell you, I care so much about this, I wrote a book on it. It's called Christians in the Age of Outrage, but I want to tell you a little funny story about it to start. So 2016, I was uh, new to my role. I I used to run a research firm called Lifeway Research, and I had just come to the Billy Graham Center where I serve now at Wheaton College and also serving there as a professor. And I met with my publisher, and they talked about what the next book that I should write would be. And they suggested a book on outrage. They said, man, everybody, 2016, remember how, how people were outraged in election year? Everyone was mad, and, and people were mad about people being mad. And it was just, it was a challenge. And so they said, you should write a book on outrage. And I said, you know, I mean, it takes me about a year to write a book. And then it takes about a year for a book to go through the system by the time they edit it and put it in a bookstore. And so that's two years. So I said to the publisher, yeah, 2016, everyone's outraged. But by the time we get to 2018, 19, 20, people aren't going to be outraged anymore. It's going to have calmed down. <laughs> Clearly, I misread the situation, right? <laughs> Because right now it's just getting more and more. And I want you to hear this. It's going to get worse in 2020. I'm not a prophet. I'm not the son of a prophet. I work at a nonprofit organization. But I think it's going to get worse. I think it's going to get worse in 2020. The division's growing around us. But we're not the only people to live in such divisive times. We're not the only people to live in a time when culture is enraged. And it's not just here. It's not just in our homes, in our communities, in our workplaces. Not just in our state. But it's it's, it's around the world. And so wherever you are, wherever you're joining us online, if you're here together in our worship service, wherever you are, we all need the message that we're going to have today. There's four things we're going to look at today. We're going to look at it from a passage called 2 Corinthians. It's in the book of 2 Corinthians. If you'd like to follow along in your Bible, just turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Here Paul's writing to the church at a place called Corinth. And it's a church that's become divided in and of itself, not always practicing the right values, wrapped up in so many things that weren't of the Lord, not dissimilar sometimes to our church situation in some places 2,000 years later. Uh, and the church was at odds with its community, unsure how it should engage or not engage the community, not unlike where we might be 2,000 years later. So the church at Corinth can give us some helpful guidance. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, writes this letter in the New Testament called 2 Corinthians. And he speaks with the authority of his office as an apostle, and the language is really evident as we read it. And there's four things I want us to walk through today. And as you came in, if you picked up a note sheet, you can follow along the verses there, or you can take some notes if you're so inclined. Let's walk through. Number one, we get a new perspective. We get a new perspective. Here's what it says, and if you can look at that sheet in front of you, it says, well, let's remind you, again, we're going to get a new view of things We're going to get a new view of people and how we walk steadfastly in these tumultuous times is going to partly be explained right here. Let's take a look. It says, so from now on, this point forward, from now on, we regard no one. We see, you don't see people the same way anymore. We don't regard people. We regard no one from a worldly point of view. So in other words, we're not going to see people the way the world wants us to see one another. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Maybe they didn't understand who Jesus was, and now with a clearer sense of vision, they know who he is. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. So in this passage, we find a lot of packed truth right in here to start, right? We're not going to see people in a purely human way anymore. Now, 2,000 years ago, that might have meant different things today. 
But today what we're finding is many, many people are looking at one another, looking at people that disagree with them, looking at people who have other views than they do, and seeing them as enemies to be defeated rather than as people who are made in the image of God and worthy of dignity and respect. And so what happens is the Bible here, and Paul writes, and he gives us a new way of looking at things, right? He says, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Now, worldly point of view doesn't always mean that it's the most sinful it could be. It's just shaped too much by the world. And I want to say today, we see this in the world itself, but even creeping into the church, far too many Christians are being discipled by their cable news choices. Far too many Christians are being spiritually shaped by their spiritual, by, by their social media feed. And what's happening is, is rather than seeing people through the lenses of the gospel, we're seeing people through the lenses of a cable news. We're seeing people through the lenses of a social media. And that's why this verse is so important for us today. From now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Now, that's important for us to get because right now, that's not how a lot of Christians are, are acting. Sometimes I'll look on social media and I'll say, well, that's a really terrible thing somebody said. And I'll click on the link to their bio and I'll go to something that says follower of Jesus, disciple of Jesus. Sometimes it even goes to someone who says pastor in their bio. And I think to myself, maybe we've missed out on this passage, which says, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. We don't see people through the lenses of the world. We see people through the lenses of the gospel. We've got a new look, new lenses through which we see the world. But it doesn't just end there. It ties it together with something else, right? It says this. It says, therefore, if you have that little sheet of paper, circle the word therefore for just a second. Whenever you see a therefore, you want to ask the question, what's it there for? What's it doing? Right? So it's therefore connecting those things together, right? So the next verse you probably are more familiar with if you've been around church for a while. It says, therefore, if anyone's in Christ... The new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. Maybe you know that verse because you've been around church for a while. Maybe you got it as a refrigerator magnet. Maybe you memorized it in another translation. But you know this, right? That we are new creation. We are made anew. We are born again, to use Jesus' exact words. Now, if you're here today and those words are foreign to you, what I want to say to you is you can indeed trust and follow Jesus. Yeah. You can repent of your sin, ask Jesus into your heart, follow him as Savior and Lord, receive the new life he has for you. But if you came here today, or maybe you're watching online, and you kind of starting 2020, you're trying to maybe be a better person, and you thought, maybe I could get some religion in my life, and that would make me a, a better person. I want you not to miss this, right? See, the Christian life is not about getting some religion. It's not about turning over a new leaf for 2020. The Christian life's not about turning over a new leaf. It's about receiving new life life. And receiving new life in Christ makes you a new creation, okay? We can do a whole message on that. But the key here is the word therefore. You see, these are connected together. I've got a new life if I'm a follower of Jesus. I've got a new life. I've got a new look. I've got new lenses through which I see the world. Gospel lenses now. From now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. How do you look differently at people who differ from you or people that similarly think like you do, or people who maybe, maybe want to argue, or some people who maybe you're not getting along well with at work. Well, that comes back to this. I got a new life. It gives me a new way of looking at things, a new look, a new set of lenses through which we see the world. Now, you've noticed I've touched my glasses a few times, and, and I see some of you. Just, just don't be embarrassed. Raise your hand if you are got glasses. God, just do it. Four eyes. It's all right. It's all good. Um, <laughs> No, it's all good. That's, we don't, they don't say that as much anymore. But when I was a kid, I was terrified when I got new glasses. I remember coming home, and my mother, she came to me, and she said, Eddie, she called me Eddie, and you may not. And she said, Eddie, uh, you're going to have to get glasses. She said, you're going to get glasses. And she tried to make it sound like a good thing, like it was a dessert or some sort of party. She said, Eddie, you're going to get new glasses. And I said, Mom, no way. People will make fun of me at school. And she said, they're not going to make fun of you. And then she told me I had to wear an eye patch because I had one, it's called a lazy eye, so I had to wear glasses and an eye patch. I said, Mom, they're going to be merciless. She said, no, they're going to think you're a pirate. And uh, that was probably the first day I realized that my mother didn't always tell me the truth about things. So I went off to school, and they made fun of me mercilessly. So fast forward a few decades later, and... Donna, just sitting right here, Donna comes home one day with Caitlin, and 
As Pastor John mentioned, I, I have three. I have three daughters, which is just so great. I love having three daughters. There, um, it's one of the it, just. It's, it's a, quite a blessing, um, and that's just a statement of my situation and a desperate request for intercessory prayer on your part. If you know, <laughs> we just pray for me, pray for us, right? And because uh, they're great kids, but they have so many words. They just talk all, all the time. Anyway, it's another story. Another story for another day. So. Um, so they're 15, 17, and, 19, and 21. Excuse me, 15, 17, 21. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Let's just take a moment to pray. You pray. Put, extend your hands towards me. Uh, no, don't do that. Okay, so, so Donna comes home, and she comes in, and she says, hey, Caitlin, she, Caitlin's not here, but she says, Caitlin's going to get glasses. Something like, don't make a big deal about it. So, of course, which offends me. Like, do I make a big deal about things? Okay, maybe. All right, so... Um, so I go to Caitlin, I'm trying to encourage her, give her some dad skills, right? So I, so I go to Caitlin and say, hey, Caitlin, I hear you're getting new glasses. Hey, that's like so not a big deal. Okay? That's going to be just great. And, and she looks at me and she sees right through the farce that I'm trying to pull off here. She, uh, she, she's not allowed to roll her eyes at her parents, so she uses her voice to roll her eyes. Here's what she says. Dad, that is a, a, an eye roll without eye movement, right? So that's what she does. And she says, Dad, glasses are cool today. People wear them to be cool. I said, no. She said, yeah, people actually go. I'm learning this from my 13-year-old middle schooler, right? She says, people are going to Walmart and buying frames with no prescription. Some of you are nodding your head. You know this to be true. So they can wear them to school and be cool. And I'm thinking, I'm so excited for her and simultaneously bitter about my own childhood. <laughs> Is that wrong? Can I do that? So... So, but that's okay. See, I don't wear glasses for fashion. I wear glasses for seeing. So I, my glasses are on right now so I can see you when I'm talking. And if they get knocked around my head and they end up down here, you disappear. The focal length is wrong and I'm talking to an empty room. I do this and I'm like, hey, welcome to New Hope. Glad you're here. So why? Because here's the thing I want you to not miss, right? We've got these, this new life, this new look, new lenses through which we see the world. But you know what happens in a tumultuous time? Those lenses get knocked around a lot. And we can get out of focus. And I know a lot of believers, and sometimes Ed Stetzer included, get out of focus. And we need to readjust our gospel lenses. Now, I mentioned touching my glasses. And so let me tell you a quick fun story. So I, I'm the interim teaching pastor of a church in Chicago called the Moody Church. So the Moody Church is this uh, old downtown church in Chicago. It's 150 years old. It's old for U.S. standards, and it's um, D.L. Moody uh, founded it, and it's had some pastors along the way like Harry Ironside and Warren Wiersbe and most recently Erwin Lutzer, who's now Pastor Emeritus. And so three and a half years ago, they asked me to be the interim for six months, and so I started that interim and I'm still there. And uh, what happens is over the time, we've made some changes, not a lot of changes, just some little changes, because when you have interim, you don't make a lot of changes. But I, for example, I quit wearing a suit and tie every week. Now, I know you have not probably had a pastor in a suit and tie in a long time. Uh, but I quit wearing a suit and tie, which is very different from a church that has a big choir behind you and an orchestra. It's very traditional. Um, and then I, 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 we, we had this pulpit that looked like a World War II tank. It was just this big and this wide. And I said, let's not use that pulpit. Let me use a table. And that, some people loved that. Some people didn't. We put a screen here for the verses. So I pointed the verses. So I got letters from people from time to time. Some of them super encouraging, most of them super encouraging. It's a wonderful church, but sometimes in a church like this where people have been there a long time, sometimes they send letters and they're not as nice. Uh, and you know, so I got those. But this one I'm gonna show you right now is the fav my favorite letter. This is actually, well, I'll show you in a minute. It's, it's unedited. I just took it, I got it on my phone. I took a screenshot of it on my phone. I took off the part that said, Dear Pastor, and he actually signed it. And let me share with you this amazing letter. Let's take a look at it together here on your screen. I'll just read it. I'm gonna read it unedited. It says this. I listened to your August 13th sermon at Moody Church Online. After listening to it once, you know, because you listened more than once, praise God. I listened again, amen. Because I was awestruck, this is going to end well with the number of times you adjusted your glasses while preaching. <laughs> so the second time I listened, I saw in the first 36 minutes of your sermon, you adjust your glasses 74 times. <laughs> which is an inconceivable amount. So it appears he takes a break and he gets a calculator. 
in just a minute, we'll see that. But, but here's what he says, and I can hear the passion growing in his voice. It says, and then you took them off, so I counted no further. I mean, I can hear the passion. And, and then he gets to the calculator. This was an average of once every 30 seconds. But lest his calculation be off, he says, but keep in mind this was an incomplete count because some of the time scripture or your sermon, you can hear the passion, was on the screen and I could not see you. <laughs> right? Isn't that awesome? I tell you this in Christian love. Now, he genuinely was, and, and, and everyone says that, and not all of them mean it, but in this case, he was actually trying to help me out. He said, I tell you this in Christian love, because I know you're interested in being aware of anything that may distract listeners from hearing what you are preaching, teaching. So I hope, here's his passion, right, that you will accept this knowing I want your ministry to be as effective for Christ as possible. <laughs> Why do I adjust my glasses? <laughs> so I can see you. Now, I saw a couple of you just turn to one another and said, I'm going to count how many times he adjusts his glasses. By the no, nobody likes that guy. Don't be that guy. Don't be that guy. But you see, he actually wanted to help me, and I made changes in light of this. I don't touch my glasses that much. Now, don't count. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. But, but, but I will tell you that, that I got some nerd wax, it's called, and it slows the amount of sliding down my nose. But here's the thing I don't want you to miss, right? We live in a very divided, tumultuous age. And it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. And that means we're going to be jostled and tussled and knocked around some. And if your gospel lenses get out of place and it gets out of view, you end up seeing people in a worldly way. And through the power of the Holy Spirit and in submission to the Lord Jesus Christ, we got to readjust these glasses, these gospel lenses. So the new life, the new look, the new lenses help us to see the world the way Jesus calls us to see it. And that's not always easy. But it starts with we get a new look. Number two on our outline is um, sent on a mission of reconciliation. So we get a new perspective, number two, sent on a mission of reconciliation. Now it says this, it says all this is from God, ties it into what's before, uh, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You may notice the pattern. Reconciled, he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. But he repeats himself with a little expansion, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. You want to be steadfast in a world divided? You want to be people of Issachar and discern the times well? Too many are tossed to and fro because they forget their mission. See, we're sent on a mission of reconciliation to share the good news of the gospel to a world that instead is filled with anger and vitriol and division, Jesus calls us to tell them of a better way because someone has told us of that better way. See, if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, you're a follower of Jesus because somebody told you. Somebody told you, and let me tell you something that may be news to you, somebody told that person. And someone told that person, then that person, and all the way back to 2,000 years ago when Jesus said to the disciples, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Yeah. And they did, and they told someone, and they told someone, and they told someone, and then 2,000 years later, somebody told you. And here's this mission of reconciliation. People would say, I'm reconciled by God through Jesus' death on the cross for my sin and in my place. I'm reconciled by God. Now I've got this message of reconciliation to be shared. It's like a great commission highway that goes back 2,000 years that somebody tells somebody tells somebody tells you, and then you're supposed to tell somebody who tells somebody who tells somebody. It's a great commission highway over 2,000 years. But I gotta tell you, I don't hear a lot of people sharing the gospel right now. And I think sometimes right now, even with the growing bad reputation that Christians sometimes have in culture, as the culture is becoming more intolerant towards Christian belief and practices, sometimes responding to things we shouldn't have said in the way we shouldn't have said it, but sometimes just responding to our beliefs. As the world's getting more intolerant, too many Christians are getting more silent. Jesus has called us because we're reconciled to be agents of reconciliation. Now, I don't want you to miss this because, you know, we lived in Chicago for two years before anybody tried to spark up a spiritual conversation with us. Let me tell you about that day. Don and I were um, going down to uh, Florida 
It was February, I was doing a conference in Florida, and whenever the words February and Florida are together, Donna wants to join me there from Chicago. So we were going there together, because there's this thing in Chicago that you're really not familiar with, it's called cold. Right? And it's right now cold there. We don't want to go home. It's like 18 degrees today. We don't want to go home. 18 degrees is colder than a legalist's heart. And that's like super cold. That's super cold, right? So, so, um, so, so we get in the car, and this Uber comes up, and we get in the car, and the Uber driver starts talking to us as soon as we get in, which is not uncommon. Uber drivers are often, you know, trying to strike up a conversation. And she says, you know, if you need any water, there's water in the seats behind you. Um, I've got any chargers you need for your phone, just let me know. Uh, and take anything you want from the middle. And in the middle was a little basket, and in the little basket was candy and a pocket New Testament. So we knew something was about to be afoot, and we were kind of excited about it. So Don and I have been married for over 30 years, so we actually communicate telepathically at this point. <laughs> it happens a little after your 30th anniversary, and so... So I look over to her, she's right there so I can re kind of reenact it right now. I look over to her and I say telepathically, let's not tell her and let's have a little fun with this. And she looks back at me and telepathically says, yeah, but don't you cross any lines here. Don't do, don't do anything wrong in this. Let's, but, but she was going to go along with it, so I had permission. So, so Jane is her name and Jane starts asking us questions leading to spiritual questions. She says, you know, so where are you from? And Donna's from Canada and I'm from outside of New York City on Long Island. Uh, you know, what, uh, you have any kids? We have three kids. Um, how long you lived there? About two years at the time. She asked me once a question that I didn't want to answer, you see, because I'm a professor at Wheaton College Graduate School, and I teach like evangelism and missions and how to reach people. So I didn't want to answer what I did. So she asked me, so what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a teacher. What do you do? Just asked her quickly before she could follow up. And she said, well, I'm a realtor, but sometimes I like to drive Uber, and, uh, and I get to talk to people. And I said, that's so great. So we're driving down, having this conversation. I'm dodging the questions I want to dodge. And so about 15 minutes in, she asks a question that's kind of hard to dodge. Here's what she says. She says, well, do you guys have any, like, uh, spiritual beliefs or religious background or anything like that? And at that point, Donna looked over at me and communicated telepathically, you have to tell her now. <laughs> She's the godly one in the relationship. And so... So I leaned forward and said, Jane, yes, actually we do. We are Christians. As a matter of fact, I'm a professor and I teach evangelism and you are doing so great right now. This is awesome. A plus for you. And I said, can I just record an interview with you? And she said, sure. And so you can actually Google Jane the Uber driver and you can find the whole story. It got picked up by some national radio programs, tell the story. Um, and we flew down to Florida, just blessed by Jane. She's a family friend now. And we flew down to Florida, and the next morning, we got a phone call early that uh, Billy Graham had died. And um, being, held, being leading the Billy Graham Center, being at Wheaton College where Billy and Ruth went to school, uh, our lives got very busy and changed. And a week or so later, we're at the funeral, and the report, a reporter came up to me, you know, this part of what our job is to kind of answer questions, and so came up to me, she's from the New York Times, and she asked me the normal questions, what happens now that Billy Graham's gone, what's his greatest legacy? But then she asked the question I was ready for, but there's really no answer for. She asked the question, um, who's the next Billy Graham? And nobody in the family claims to be that. Nobody outside the family should claim to be that. Uh, he's just a, a unique man that God used in unimaginable ways. We shouldn't say anyone's the next Billy Graham. And so, but she asked it. I knew they were going to ask it. So, so she asked, so who's the next Billy Graham? And I was ready. I said, Jane the Uber driver is the next Billy Graham. <laughs> and she looked at me and I explained the story and she said, that's a great story, but it's, it's not making the New York Times. <laughs> but here's the thing. In a sense, Jane's not the next Billy Graham, but... But Billy Graham, was he the next Mordecai Ham? That's who he heard the gospel from. And who shared the gospel with Mordecai Ham? Or who shared the gospel with Jane? Again, we're living, if you're a follower of Jesus, you are looking back on a 2,000-year Great Commission highway where somebody who was reconciled shared the gospel of reconciliation. Someone who was reconciled shared the gospel of reconciliation. And then you were reconciled. And I'm just asking in 2020 that you not let your life be a cul-de-sac on God's Great Commission highway. Listen on the clapping thing. Get in or get out. <laughs> Either clap or don't clap. Let's just do a clap just for practice. Go ahead. <laughs> Give a clap. Right. That's a clap. Pastor John got a little excited, and four or five of you tried to support him. Don't do that. <laughs> if it doesn't emerge from the group, don't, don't join in. Number one, 
we get a new perspective. Number two, sent on a mission of reconciliation. Number three, representing Jesus and his kingdom. Now, here's the role that we have today. This is what it's like to be a person of Issachar, who's going to discern the times, how to steadfastly live for Christ as an ambassador. Number three, representing Jesus and his kingdom. Verse 20 says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now, Paul's actually not talking about us 2,000 years later. He's talking about himself and a group of missionaries that he's with. He's defending his apostleship, which I mentioned earlier. We don't have time to fully unpack. But for 2,000 years, Christians have called themselves ambassadors, and rightly so. Because we've been made citizens of a kingdom that's not of this world. And as it's not of this world, we're representing it here in this world. And one other place he says ambassador, in fact, our whole Bible is only one other place uses the word ambassador. And it's where Paul says, I'm an ambassador in change. You see, it's not always such an easy job to be an ambassador. This past year, in last May, we had our commencement uh, service, our graduation at Wheaton College. And our graduation speakers were somebody you probably know. Uh, you won't know them at first, probably, but their names are Andrew and Noreen Brunson. And we knew them specifically because they were grads from Wheaton College, and then they went to become missionaries, and eventually they were serving a church in Turkey where one day suddenly the police came and arrested them. And you may have caught the story from there that he became this pastor. Uh, Noreen was arrested but released within a couple of weeks, but he was held unjustly and without, charge, without proper charges for two years. And people talked about it all over the world, from the White House to the Secretary of State to members of Congress. People were calling for a release of this pastor. We had prayer vigils at Wheaton College. Uh, we, we talked about it at different churches. It was on the front page of the newspaper. And here he was speaking at graduation now because he had been freed. But in his story, I was moved at his story because he said, I was there in a Turkish prison trying to share Jesus with my guards, my captors, and other prisoners. But then he talked about, there were times when I was ready to give up. There were times when I broke. And he talked about being in a cell that was meant for this number of people with multiple times more. Being in a cell with people who think Christians should be wiped off and, and put away. And, 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 and the danger to himself and the physical struggle that was there. He said, I broke at times. I wasn't prepared for the persecution. And he said, we need to be ready for that, he told our graduates. And his ministry now is telling people, we need to be ready for that if and when that comes. But he sought to be an ambassador in chains. Struggled at times, but represented Jesus. But then if you saw the news, one day he was released. And 36 hours later, he was flown from Turkey, got, got a checkup, got, made sure he was well, changed clothes, got cleaned up, continued all the way to the White House and went right to the Oval Office within 36 hours. You might have seen it. It was on every news station that night. It was live on all the news channels because what he did was he thanked God and he said, can I just pray right now? And he started praying a deep and rich gospel prayer. And people all around the world saw this man who just 48, 72 hours ago was unsure if he was ever going to be out of the Turkish prison that broke him at times, but he still sought to represent Jesus, to then, 36 hours later, representing Jesus in the Oval Office right next to the president and showing the love of Christ to the whole world. Sisters and brothers, we don't know how we'll be called to be ambassadors. We just know that we're called to be ambassadors. Our job is to show up and say, Jesus, use me for your purposes in this place and in this time. And I got to tell you, I love our enthusiasm. I appreciate the enthusiasm. But statistically, we're just not doing that. Again, I've run a statistics firm for, for 10 years. Uh, every time I quote a statistic, an angel actually gets its wings. Um, <laughs> but most people aren't reaching out to their neighbors, their coworkers, or their friends. So being an ambassador means to show and share the love of Jesus. So number one, we get a new perspective. Number two, sent on a mission of reconciliation. Number three, representing Jesus and his kingdom. Number four, because of the cross. Jot that in the notes if you're following along. The passage takes a rather sudden turn here, a whole different feel to it. And I want to finish up, and I'll, I'll close with this. Do you know what it means when a guest speaker says, I'll close with this in the last service of the morning? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Hoped you packed lunches. But anyway, let's... Uh, will just be a couple minutes more. It says this in 2 Corinthians 5, it says, God made 
him who had no sin. Him who had no sin is Jesus. God made Jesus, him who had no sin, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I don't want you to miss this, okay? Because it seems unrelated to the rest of the passage, but stay with me, but here's what it says. When Jesus was dying on the cross for your sin and in your place, your sin and my sin was deposited in Jesus. He didn't just die for your sin, he was made your sin. So it, there's, a, there's a theological word for that, it's called imputation. Say it out loud with me imputation. Everybody this time. Imputation. Try to work it into a conversation with a friend this week. So what is imputation, right? I believe if you can learn to order coffee at Starbucks, you can learn some theological words at church. So imputation, imputation is a first century word that means like a banking term to deposit into. Your sin was deposited into Jesus. But then it goes on from there and it says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So don't miss this. What happens now is, is Jesus' righteousness is imputed, is deposited into you. And don't miss that. When God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin or the stupid things you've done. He sees Jesus' righteousness. So our sin was deposited in Jesus, and his righteousness was deposited in us. Now where I come from, that would elicit a serious group amen. That was not a serious group, amen. <laughs> Let me say it again so you don't miss it. Our sin deposited into Jesus, his righteousness deposited into us. Amen. And it is, it changes everything. It changes so much that it becomes the motivation for everything we've talked about today. You say, Ed, I just think I should be able to say anything I want on social media. I can just rant and rave. I'm just being frank. Well, listen, if your name's not Frank, you need to stop. And if your name is Frank, you need to do it under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You see, because of the cross, now I got a new life, a new look, new lenses through which I see the world. I got a mission of reconciliation. I've been reconciled. Now I'm on a mission of reconciliation, not letting my life be a cul-de-sac on the Great Commission Highway. I've got a task, a role as ambassador representing Jesus and his kingdom. And all of these things are true because of what Jesus has done on the cross. Now, my encouragement to you is simple. We're at the, near the beginning of the year. Pastor John was joking, how long do we say um, Happy New Year to one another? Well, let's do it one more time, at least today. Because I want 2020 to be a year where you live steadfastly, representing Jesus and his kingdom, and living like women and men of Issachar, discerning the times and knowing this is what we should do. So I want to lead us in a time of prayer to respond, to give you the opportunity to say how God's speaking to you, how his spirit's nudging you today to be people of Issachar, to live steadfast lives, and to represent Jesus in his kingdom. Would you pray with me? Father, we acknowledge and come before you today that in and of ourselves, we can't do any of these things. That the end of the passage is so necessary for us to even consider the beginning of it. Father, I pray for women and men, young people, and maybe watching online or here with us in our service who don't know you, who hear these words like, but I don't know Christ. And Father, I pray you might speak to hearts today and that folks might not leave here today without talking to one of our staff or one of our volunteers and saying, man, I need to know more about this Jesus. And Father, I pray for believers like me who sometimes find their gospel lenses are out of adjustment. They've been jostled and tussled too much and they need to take the time and the power of the Holy Spirit, submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and readjust that new life, that new look, that new lenses through which they see the world. Maybe that's you today, and I want you to just take just a moment if that's where you are and say, man, Lord, I just, I, I've got to see people differently. My heart's got to change. Just if that's where you are, just call out to him. Lord, my heart's got to change because I'm mad at these people and I, I just want to see them go away. I just want to see them canceled. I, I want them done, gone. And, and then our gospel lenses tell us these are people made in the image of God who need Jesus perhaps. Or maybe it's just you've let your life be that cul-de-sac on the Great Commission Highway. Maybe in the quietness of this moment, you might say, Lord, bring to my heart, to my mind, people in 2020 that you're calling me to share the message of reconciliation. I've been reconciled to God through Christ. Father, let me continue that Great Commission Highway. Prompt my heart through your Holy Spirit. Who am I share the good news? Or maybe 
I just got to say, Lord, I haven't represented you particularly well as an ambassador. I'm known for other things. My conversation at work, my social media feed, my, my conversations with family, friends, and neighbors. Just ask the Lord to give you the privilege to represent him in obedience to say, here I am, Lord, send me. But all of those things, let's dwell on the cross, on the cross where Jesus took your sin into himself. He died a sinner's death, though he was not a sinner. And because of that, I can walk in his righteousness. Just thank God for the cross. Thank Jesus for the cross, which gives us the, the power to do everything else we've talked about today and the power of the Spirit and the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Lord, remind us to be steadfast, to be people of Issachar, and to represent Jesus and his kingdom well. For it's in Jesus' name and for his good sake that we pray. Amen. And amen. amen. Can we thank Dr. Ed Setzer for that?